Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Lee. Uh, she holds a Doctor of Pharmacy degree and currently is the adjunct assistant professor at the University of Iowa and clinical pharmacy specialist in the Department of uh, Neurology. And uh, she very kindly has accepted our invitation uh, today to provide us with a review of pharmacotherapy in multiple sclerosis. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I could not make, there in, make it there in person, but uh, thank you so much for the invitation here to present the review of pharmacotherapy therapy and multiple sclerosis. Um, my name is Nancy Lee. I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist here in the adult neurology clinic at University of Iowa's hospital and clinics. Um, I primarily help with patients and providers in the neuroimmunology division. And I also help with migraine as well. So first off, um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, um, but just to kind of get things kick started, um, I thought this was kind of funny to kind of bring in into the conversation because I know um, with the landscape of treatment options for multiple sclerosis, we kind of start thinking, where do I even start? Because there's so many options out there. Um, so to kind of help facilitate, that's uh, the part of this the discussion here. So the, the objectives include to understand and recall precautions of monitoring requirements for disease modifying therapies or DMTs for multiple sclerosis, and also to determine appropriate therapy based on patient specific factors. Um, before we hop into the DMTs, I just wanted to zoom out a little bit and kind of provide a brief overview of, how, of the different treatment um, approaches to a, a patient with MS. So um, as far as acute treatments, um, the ultimate goal of this is to, um, in the moment of an MS flare, to shorten that period of time to recovery. And oftentimes the mainstay of treatment in this case are steroids, either oral um, or IV. Most likely though, um, with this treatment course, it does not alter uh, the disease course in the long run, but it's just to have helps in the moment. As far as MS goes, um, it's important that we treat the patient holistically holistically as well, um, improving their quality of life. So here listed in the symptomatic treatments um, is a list of different um, other medications um, available out in the community pharmacy to help patients with their muscle spasm, their incontinence, um, their fatigue, their neuropathy, et cetera. And then finally, um, the part where the majority of this talk will be about is the disease modifying treatment or therapies here. And the ultimate goal of this um, treatment group is to reduce further MS relapses. Unfortunately, with these treatments, um, it, it can only prevent future damage um, and reduce the likelihood of future disease flares, um, not likely to um, re reverse you know, the damage that's happened in the past. So the goal of these DMTs is to overall minimize um, the disease burden of MS and ways to kind of do that um, is reducing those, reducing the incidence of relapses, trying to preserve as much neurological function as possible, um, prevent progression of the disease, minimize the side effects. Um, Cause as we talk more about the treatment options, the side effects kind of vary from very minimal, um, generally tolerable to all the way down to malignancy. And then also to, to optimize the quality of life um, for the patient. Some factors that often impact a patient's DMT choice um, include risk aversion. So um, with the, the treatment options, kind of how we talked about earlier with the side effect profile, sometimes patients are um, we educate patients about the risk of malignancies and such, and if their, you know, if their disease burden is so high and the risks are outweigh the benefits, and that's definitely a direction that we'll lean towards. Um, the patient's ability to self-administer those drugs. Um, so some of the times, patients uh, for some of the treatment options are auto injectors. So for our um, 
patients who have increased disability, that may not be an option for them. Transportation, so um, one of the treatment option route, administration routes for disease modifying therapies are infusions. So organizing logistics to ensure the patient's able to take a full day out of uh, their work week if they're still working um, to get to the infusion um, is something to consider. Medication adherence. Um, so some of these medications, their dosing kind of varies from daily tablets to monthly injections to every six month infusion. So that kind of varies based off of the patient's lifestyle. Um, a big thing that I play a huge role in as a pharmacist is kind of helping navigate the insurance coverage part. I oftentimes just tell patients up front, hey, um, sometimes you just have to play games with the insurance and go through and, you know, try out their formulary medications before we can um, try some other medications down the line that may be a little bit more efficacious. Um, other things, too, to consider are comorbid comorbid diseases and other treatments that they have on the plate. And then finally, family planning. So for our childbearing age females, um, are they interested in getting pregnant? Is that coming up on the timeline or is it further down the timeline? So um, here's a brief uh a graphic here that we created to kind of organize the different DMT options based off of their administration routes. So we have self-injections. Um, those include the platform drugs, the interferons, um, the glutiramir acetate, and then most recently the ofatumumab or K-Symta, which came out in 2020. Um, we have oral treatment options varying from once daily dosing to twice daily dosing. Um, those include the fumarates and then the S1Ps as well. And then finally, IV infusions. Um, those, the uh, dosing for that also varies as well, ranging from monthly infusions um, to a little bit odd dosing. Uh, we'll go into um, Limtrata a little bit later. And then the every six month B cell depleters, including Ocrevus and Bryum V. One thing, though, that you may be thinking about, um, or at least when I first started my position here, um, was that there's just so many treatment options. How how would a patient be able to kind of help decide or choose which treatment option um, is best for them? So another way that I've kind of categorized it here is um, I've included the administration at top, but then also kind of looking at efficacy and risk. Um, Across the board here with the platform injectables, um, we can kind of consider them as moderate efficacy, um, low risk, so their side effect profile um, is a lot more appealing compared to some of the other agents. And then um, a lot of the platform agents are self-injectable, so making sure the patients are able to um, put the syringe into the auto-injector to administer if they're not um, – if they don't have like a needle phobia and such. The oral – DMTs, um, we can kind of consider them as moderate efficacy with moderate to high risk, depending on how um, you want to look at the side effect profile. Um, and this category, again, as we talked about before, requires daily dosing. And then the monoclonal antibodies, which include some self-injectables and infusions, um, those some providers consider as the highest efficacy versus moderate efficacy. Um, and with that, um, the risk kind of varies between moderate to high. Um, we'll talk, kind of talk about that in, in a few slides ahead. And then, like mentioned before, they're available as infusions and self-injectables. So we'll start from the platform drugs and kind of work our way forward. So we'll start with the interferons first here. Generally, these are safe and less um, moderate to less efficacious. Here I've kind of listed the different interferons. So Avinex, Rebif, Plegardy, Beta Seron, Xtivia. The dosing varies um, and the route administration varies from sub-Q um, to intramuscular as well. Um, the big thing about this one, hopping into the mechanism first, is it's believed to work through um, the cytokines and in, involved in various mechanisms of immune modulation. Um, as far as lab monitoring goes, the biggest takeaway points for this one includes monitoring your CBC with uh, differential um, at baseline, months one, three, six, and then every six months thereafter. And the same is with the LFTs or the liver function test as well. Um, as far as side effects goes, these patients um, oftentimes 
we hear a lot of patients experiencing those injection site reactions in the flu-like symptoms. So muscle aches, feeling really tired. Um, another thing to keep in mind with this drug, this class of medications is that um, it can worsen a patient's incidence of depression or suicidal ideation. So if a patient comes in with um, you know, worsening depression or SI, then we want to th- look at their drug list and see if they're actually on an interferon because that may be contributing to it. Or if a patient at baseline already has these, uh, dep- like a, has depression, then this, this drug may not be one to start a patient on. As far as pregnancy risk goes, this is what we would consider a class C if we use the old terminology back in the day. So using risk versus benefit to decide if we want to continue this drug safely during pregnancy. Um, And then finally, as far as drug interactions go, um, the big things to look out for with this one is methotrexate or um, zidovudine, um, an HIV medication. So with this one, it's specifically the zidovudine is with Rebif and Avonex. Um, What it could potentially do is increase the toxicity of the zidovudine, not the Rebif. Moving on to glutiramir acetate, um, these are available as copaxone, glotopa, and a generic glutiramir acetate as well. The dosing varies from daily to three times a week, um, and the milligrams are listed there. As far as how the medication works, um, it's a racemic polymer mixture of the myelin basic protein. What it does is it competes for binding um, to the major histamine compatibility complex, which induces Th2 cells. As far as monitoring goes, this is one of the safest medications um, that we have used to treating MS, so it doesn't um, require any monitoring requirement, uh, does not require any monitoring parameters. As far as side effects goes, based off of the routed administrations, injection site reactions are are, um, prone with this one. Sometimes patients um, also talk about what's called lipoatrophy, or um, it's kind of shown in the picture there where there's... um, The area where they give themselves ejections frequently kind of dimples in um, that that they're losing the fat in that area. And then also, too, there's a rare um, incidence of um, transient chest pain or shortness of breath. But overall, generally, um, this medication is uh, generally well tolerated aside from the injection site reactions, which is why it's very important to encourage patients to rotate injection site reaction or injection sites uh, to prevent the reactions from occurring. This medication is generally safe during pregnancy. Um, There actually have been some studies to say patients continue um, Colpaxone while patients become pregnant. Some providers um, choose to do so. Some, they choose to take patients off of DMT treatment during pregnancy, but this one is, um, is okay to continue during it. And then as far as drug interactions go, um, as we will see with future, with most DMTs, if the patients are on any other immunosuppressant agents, um, we want to just have a f- full discussion with those who are prescribing the other immunosuppressant agents to seeing if it's worthwhile to keep both drugs on on board, or if we need a discussion about maybe we should ch- choose a different option. Moving on to the monomethyl fumarate prodrugs. Um, so these are the three in this specific class, um, dimethyl fumarate or tecfidera. Um, there's also a generic available um, of Umeridi and then bifuritam. The first two agents all um, get metabolized and broken down to the monomethyl fumarate or the bifuritam that's listed um, at the bottom there. And the dosing is um, generally the same. So the patients start on a lower dose first, for seven days. Um, It's a twice daily med. um, And that's just to make sure the patients tolerate the med. And then eventually, if they do tolerate it, then we'll increase the dose to the higher um, twice daily dosing. As far as how this um, medication works, um, ultimately it reduces the number of circulating T cells in the body through the nuclear factor-like two pathway activation. Um, For monitoring parameters, this one, um, similar to the interferons as mentioned, so uh, we want to be sure to monitor the CBC with differential, specifically looking at the lymphocytes here, and then also to the LFTs or the liver function test, so we're looking at AST, ALT, and total bilirubin. 
this medication, we want to check the base uh, the labs at baseline and then every three to six months. Um, the main reason why we're wanting to monitor them so frequently is to watch out for um, lymphopenia um, with this medication. And then uh, the rare incidence of PML um, is also a, a consideration for this medication. So when the ALC gets to be less than 500, then that's where we're concerned. Most oftentimes what I've seen in practice is that when patients um, AL, ALC starts creeping towards 500 or get a little gets a little bit less than 1,000 or uh, 750 area, then that's when we start considering holding the medication to check and see if the patient's uh, ALC rebounds. As far as other side effects goes, um, patients oftentimes experience flushing or stomach upset with the first dose, and generally it should get better with time. Um, to strategies to kind of help mitigate the flushing, so um, patients can consider taking um, a baby aspirin, non enteric coated, um, 30 minutes before their medication administration um, to help reduce the incidence of a flushing. Patients can also pair their um, Tecfidera, Vumerity, or Bifuritam with a meal. Um, Vumerity specifically has a calorie restriction, so you can encourage patients to either pair it with like a high protein meal to prevent, uh, to not exceed that calorie uh, limitation, um, trying to prevent administration with high fats um, is important. So those strategies can help patients with reducing that stomach upset side effect. But generally, um, these two, specifically the stomach upset side effect is more common with Tecfidera. Vumerity has a lesser incidence of it. Um, so if patients come and um, report such, then maybe we can switch them to a different agent, especially if this class is working for them. This medication is, um, I categorize it as a Category C, so taking a risk versus benefit uh, strategy when a patient presents with pregnancy in this case. Um, and then as far as drug and drug interactions goes, there's not really many that are, there's aren't any many listed with it, but I would also kind of um, speculate that if a patient's also on, you know, immunosuppressants as well, just kind of having a bigger group discussion to make sure that, you know, everybody is aware of what's going on. The next group of drugs that we'll kind of talk about here is the sphingosy one phosphate receptor modulators. Um, we'll kind of talk about the general class first, and then we'll kind of review the dosing in the next slide since there's four agents in this class. Overall, how this medication works is it alters the lymphocyte migration, resulting in sequestration of the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. Um, what this does is it re ultimately reduces the synaptic degeneration and promotes CNS remyelination. Um, and this medication works pretty fast. Um, so it's rapid elimination and rapid reversal of the effects of patients um, get discontinued off of this med. As far as monitoring goes, um, this medication compared to the ones that we've previously talked about has a little bit more extensive monitoring um, included with this class. So as far as pre-screening goes, patients are recommended to get a baseline um, ECG, have an eye and skin exam, and then get screening for their zoster antibodies and ensuring if they needed vaccines or not. Um, patients are also recommended to get a CBC with differential, checking their LFTs, and then the SIP testing is specifically for saponamide or maziant, um, so that's something to consider as well. As far as side effect goes, just based off of how this medication works, there's a bunch of CNC1 um, receptors all over the body, um, so, so um, the side effects kind of correlate it correlate with it. Um, so patients have um, potential incidence of bradyarrhythmias, AV block, stomach upset, headaches, back pain, cough. Um, there's a rare case of PML, um, potentials for zoster or crypto, um, macular edema, skin cancer, and a, a rare incidence of press as well. Um, one big thing to remember, though, about this treatment class is that upon continuation of this therapy, um, there is a high incidence of disease flare uh, for this class. So if for any reason we end up 
stopping medicine, then we should have tentatively a, a plan set up to either transition a patient to a different DMT or having further conversations as to why we discontinued it and, um, you know, getting those um, problems either addressed or, or lined up to be resolved soon. This, this medication is considered a category X. So if patients um, end up do becoming pregnant um, or if birth or family planning is on the table, then this is a cl class that we would not consider uh, and use for treatment of the patient's multiple sclerosis. And then as far as drug interactions goes, um, these are just a few examples of uh potential uh, drug interactions with this class. So any QTC prolonging agents, beta blockers, um, inducers or inhibitors of CYP2C9 or 3A4, um, other immunosuppressants and, and live vaccines. So um, there's more to be included. So um, if, if anything to remember with this specific drug class is if this class is on a patient's med list, then maybe we should double check with either the pharmacist or run an interaction report on Micromedics or Lexicomp to make sure that um, we can get those addressed. Uh, for the specific agents in this class, we've got Jeleni or Fingolamide, which is also available as generic. Um, this, all these classes, before we hop in too far, is all of them are once daily dosing. Some of them have a titration. Some of them you can just start right off the bat. Um, specifically with this agent, this is one of the oldest agents um, on of of the four, um, this is this medication is also um, approved for use in pediatric MS as well. Um, but this dosing is specifically for adults. Um, this agent um, does require a six-hour cardiac monitoring after the first dose um, because of that risk of bradyarrhythmias and such. Um, as far as the other medications in this class, such as Maisie and Symposia and Ponvori, um, those medications don't require first dose monitoring unless a patient has a cardiac history that uh, would indicate you know, further monitoring in that case. Um, for saponamide or Maisiant, um, there's a titration that's included in dose adjustments that are required if the patients um, have a specific gen um, genotype for the the SIP testing. Um, as far as ozonamide or zoposia, um, this medication is also indicated for ulcerative colitis for moderate to severe. And then ponvori or ponisamide, um, there's a titration available for that one. Nothing too special about that one other than um, as the newer agents have come out, the binding to specific sphincusy receptors become more specific. Um, so they have a lesser incidence of those cardiacs um, adverse events. Therefore, uh, those medications don't require that first dose monitoring that is required with the fingolamide or gelenia. Um, the next medication that I'll kind of talk about is teraflutamide or abagio. Um, this medication, you can start patients at either 7 or, milligr or, 7 or 14 milligram once daily. How this medication works in MS is it inhibits um, pyridine biosynthesis and disrupts the interaction of T cells with the antigen presenting cells. As far as lab monitoring goes, um, this one also includes um, a CBC with differential at baseline, but then during the treatment course, um, it's only recommended if patients present with uh, bone marrow suppression or if that develops. Um, Liver function enzyme tests are rec recommended at baseline monthly for the first six months and then uh, routinely if patients have pre-existing hepatic impairment. Um, TB testing is also recommended with this medication. And then pregnancy is also a pregnancy test is also recommended with this medication as well. Um, as far as side effects goes, uh, the biggest side effects associated with this medication is stomach upset, hair thinning, hepatotoxicity, um, and neuropathy. This medication is categorized as category X. Um, this medication has, uh, because of its um, active metabolite being uh, detectable for th two years after, um, this is we this is a consideration for both males and females who are taking this medication. Um, so that could potentially harm, you know, the fetus. Um, in case um, a female were to become pregnant. Um, there is, though, a um, 
accelerated elimination process that can be completed in the case, you know, we find out a patient is pregnant while on terraflutamide or Abagio. Um, patients can either take activated charcoal um, for 11 days um, or patients can also take cholestyramine um, for 11 days as well um, to remove that medication out of the body. As far as drug interactions, um, the big ones to look out for this one are live vaccines, which you'll kind of see pop up a little bit more frequently in the next few medications that we talk about. Um, warfarin, methotrexate, the OATP1B1 or 1B3 substrates in amiodarone. So how um, these, these drug interactions, um, the effects of these drug interactions is uh, what Terraflutamide will do to Abagio. It will actually de or terraflutamide will do to warfarin is that it decreases the anticoagulant effects of warfarin. Um, with methotrexate, it increases the exposure of methotrexate in the body and increases hepatotoxicity. If patients were on um, substrates of the OTP one B one or one B three examples of these include glyburide, simvastat, and natorvastat. And then what it will do is it'll increase the exposures of those meds, um, such as glyburide, simvastat, or natorvastatin. And then with amiodarone, what it does is it increases the exposure of amiodarone in the body. Um, the next medication we'll talk about here is cladribine or mavenclad. Um, so the dosing of this medication is a, a little bit unique. Um, patients actually receive this treatment for a total of two years. Um, the, picture, the picture on here kind of shows you the dosing. So patients take the medic, uh, medication for five days on week one, repeat again a month later, and then they repeat this cycle one year later. And then after that, they're done. The reason why the um, treatment is only approved for two cycles is when they, the medication was studied, um, patients had a higher incidence of malignancy in years three and four. So um, the scientists who developed um, cladribine or mavenclad and, and were working to get it approved uh, cut, it, cut the treatment period to two years to uh, further reduce that incidence of malignancy. As far as how the medication works, it has cytotoxic effects on B and T lymphocytes through the impairment of DNA synthesis. Um, as far as lab monitoring goes, this medication has extensive lab monitoring um, that is required prior to every treatment course um, of the patient's um, of the patients while they take this medication. So those include CBC with differential LFTs, um, cancer screenings, screenings for um, infection, and those infections include herpes or TB or other opportunistic infections. Um, patients are recommended to get an MRI as well and then screen for pregnancy. Um, as you'll see a little bit later, it does also to have a category X for pregnancy. And then also, too, when patients or finish the treatment course, they also require lab monitoring afterwards as well for a few months. As far as side effects goes with this medication, um, the major ones to be on the lookout for are rash, nausea, headaches, fatigue, fever, infections, and um, PML. We talked about pregnancy um, category X, and then the big drug drug interactions to be concerned about with mavenclad or cladribine um, are live vaccines. So the next medication here that we'll talk about is natalizumab or tysabri. This is a monthly infusion that patients receive. So the dosing is 300 milligrams monthly. As far as how this medicine goes, this is the first of the monoclonal antibodies that we'll talk about. So this one specifically works against the alpha-1 subunit and the integrin molecules, ultimately reducing the adhesion of um, migration of lymphocytes across the blood vessels in the CNS. As far as monitoring goes with this medication, JC virus testing um, is required with this medication prior to um, the initiation and during uh, therapy as well. And then um, baseline MRIs and then just routine MRIs um, during the treatment. 
as far as side effects goes, um, biggest ones to be concerned of with this one is infusion-related reactions, the incidence of PML, um, fatigue, and inf increased infection risk. This medication, similar to the S1Ps, also have the potential for rebound disease upon continued issue, uh, discontinuation. So um, if that is in the patient's trajectory, then we should hopefully have um, had discussions about which medications we should switch the patient to uh, lined up ahead of time. This one's considered a category C as far as pregnancy risks. Um, so again, risk versus benefit, having a, a full discussion with the team um, and the patient. And then again, as far as drug interaction goes in, you'll, you'll see a trend um, is the biggest one to be concerned about is live vaccines. So with Tysabri, um, the this medication was approved um, for a period of time, and then it was removed from market due to the incidence of PML increasing. And then here in this uh, table here, you can kind of see a, a study that was done and kind of looking at the risk stratification for patients. And they noticed that uh, when patients test positive for the JC virus, um, and when you start looking at the patient's titer and et cetera, then that kind of correlates to with the incidence of PML happening. So in 2006, um, the medication was brought back to market in, um, with the RIMS program, also known as the MS Touch program, that requires patients to receive JC virus testing prior to the infusion and at least every six months um, with while they're on treatment. Um, so with the RIMS program in particular, the provider has to be enrolled, the patient, the facility that's um, infusing the med, and also the pharmacy that's distributing the med, if the pharmacy is involved. Um, everyone has to be tied in, and the patients are only approved for every six months uh, to receive the med. So hopefully that provides a good safety net and a checkpoint base um, to make sure that the patient is not at increase or further increased risk for PML. The next medication we'll talk about is ocrelizumab or Ocrevus. So this medication, the dosing is shown here. So patients um, have a loading dose um, over the course of two weeks and then ultimately transition to the maintenance dose of every six months. This medication does require pre-meds um, and those include IV steroids, um, Tylenol and Benadryl. This medication is the first and only treatment option that is approved for primary progressive MS. Um, as far as all the treatment options goes that we'll talk about um, today is most of them are approved for the relapsing forms, but this is the only one that is currently approved for primary progressive. How this medication works is that it specifically targets the CD20 B cells and it depletes those levels, um, which also play a huge role in the pro-inflammatory modulation in MS. As far as monitoring goes, patients um, are recommended and required to have a screening of their hepatitis B panel, and that includes the surface antigen, the surface antibody, and the core antibody. Um, we also want to be sure we have a baseline of the patient's immunoglobulins. Um, CD20 counts are optional. Sometimes um, we also, too, recommend patients to get tuberculosis testing as well, just because that can be a hidden infection. So um, in that case, that one is not required, but um, recommended if, if the lab has the capability to do such prior to starting treatment. Uh, the big side effects with this medication um, are flu-like symptoms. So oftentimes patients are experiencing that headache, the fatigue, the muscle aches, primarily with the first infusion, and then it should get better over time. Um, the other thing too is based off of the mechanism, the patients are at an increased risk of infection, specifically um, upper respiratory infections or UTIs. Um, and then infusion related reactions just based off of um, how this medication is given. Also too, it is similar to uh, rituximab if you were to get down to the molecular structure, um, hence why pre-meds are required with this infusion. Um, sometimes too, there was actually a study based out of um, University of Chicago, and they found that um, 
for additional recommendations for patients to take pre-meds at home as well can further reduce that incidence of infusion related reactions. And then this medication also has a low risk of PML. So, um, after recently speaking with the MSL of Genentech, who is the manufacturer of Ogrevis, they mentioned that um, Nash or worldwide, there's probably been about eight cases of PML um, with Ogrevis, but um, we you can kind of um, take a deeper dive into the case reports and kind of analyze to see if those are actual patients that you would you know actually consider starting on Ogrevis um, in that case. And then malignancies too, um, I forgot to mention here. So what during the studies of um, Ocrevus, the ones that were used to approve this medication, there was a higher incidence of breast cancer. Um, further looking at kind of the statistics, um, comparing the placebo group versus a treatment arm group, um, it was found to be a statistical anomaly. Um, and the, the uh, manufacturer came back to say, you know, the Ocrevus group, um, as long as the patients receive their baseline screenings and their routine screenings for breast cancer at the age-appropriate um, times, then that's um, all that's required um, for these patients who are, you know, preparing to get Ocrevus or, on, or already on Ocrevus. This medication is considered a category C, so another worse risk versus benefit um, discussion to have um, to continue Ocrevus. Oftentimes, though, um, ideally, probably when the patients get to like second trimester is probably a time where we should probably consider having a further discussion discontinue just because at that point in time, there's a high incidence of um possibility of the antibodies, you know, transferring over um, to the placenta and such. And then too, as far as drug interactions go, um, immunosuppressants and live vaccines as well. So kind of hopping into the live vaccines portion here, um, specifically speaking with ocrelizumab and Kasimta, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, these two medications, um, we would recommend patients to get all their live vaccines done before they start therapy. And then we'd have to wait four weeks um, to start therapy. And then um, afterwards, the patient can continue on with getting their ocrevus infusion. Otherwise, if they do have live vaccines planned during their infusion, then we probably should can have a greater discussion of timeline and um, maybe can potentially stopping therapy and switching to something else and then going back to Ocrevus. The next medication we'll talk about is Ofeptimumab or Kasimta. So this is the self-injectable. Um, I like to think of it as a cousin of Ocrevus um, since it works very similar. Um, the dosing here, the dosing schedule is listed here on the screen. So patients start with three pens first um, and then they'll start the monthly shots um, on starting on day 29. Um, it is a self-injectable, so patients um, similar to an EpiPen um, will not have to see the needle or anything like that. As far as mechanism goes, it's very similar to Ocrevus. The monitoring is very similar as well. Um, side effects are similar, again, to the the major difference here um, is the, this is an injection, so there's potential risk for injection site reactions. But as long as patients rotate the sites, um, that, that should hopefully resolve such. This one is considered a pregnancy category C as well. And then similar drug interactions here too. The next medication we'll talk about is alentuzumab or Limtrata. So this medication is an infusion. Um, the dosing is quite unique. Um, so patients on their first course receive five consecutive days of treatment. And then the second course is exactly 12 months after the last dose. And that's only for three days. And then patients have the option of receiving additional um, treatment courses um, yearly thereafter if they, if they need it. This one requires extensive um, pre-meds such as IV steroids with it. Um, this medication is particularly reserved for those with highly active disease after failing other treatments. Um, so if you had to, I would reserve this one's last line. How this medicine works is it depletes circulating B and T. B and T lymphocytes um, binding to the CD52. Uh, um, the monitoring and lab monitoring is quite extensive with this medication, um, similar to Mavenclad. So during screening, 
or during before pre baseline screening prior to infusions um and the lab monitoring parameters are listed there. So CBC with differential LFTs, um, monitoring their kidney, their thyroid function, skin exam, TB screening, um, vaccine history. Side effects to the associated with Lymtrata include thyroid complications, infections, um, autoimmune concerns, lymphopenia. Um, this medication does have black box warnings included with it, um, autoimmunity, infusion reactions, malignancy, um, I specifically um, stomach cancer. This medication is considered a category X. So we do not want uh, pregnant patients on this med. And as far as um, drug drug interactions goes, the biggest one, um, surprise, live vaccines. And then patients to um, S1Ps, which hopefully they're not on both the S1Ps and Lemtrada at the same time. Um, and lastly, this is the last medication we'll talk about, is Ublituximab or Brown B. This medication recently just came out late uh, 2022. So this medication is very similar to Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab. The dosing schedule is kind of similar uh, where patients have a loading dose um, over the uh, first two weeks. And then um, six months after the initial infusion, they'll start the the 450 milligrams every six months. Um, this one also does two required similar pre-meds to ocrelizumab. So they have the IV steroids, the um, Tylenol, and also the Benadryl as well. So the big question you may be asking is, what's the big difference? Um, this medication is glyco, um, was uh, glycoprotein, and it was, um, it's like a glyco-engineered form of Ocrevus. So this medication can be administered at a faster rate. Um, so Ocrevus can be administered between six and seven hours, um, as in this one can only be, can be administered over the course, or sorry, Ocrevus can be administered over three to four hours. This one can be administered over like an hour or two. Um, so it has, um, those are the benefits to this medication. Similarly, the mechanism, the monitoring, the side effects are very similar to um, Ocrevus. This medication does have a higher incidence of infusion-related reactions, but I would speculate it correlates with the faster infusion rate. So um, you can kind of decide on how you want to interpret those results. Um, again, too, this one has similar um, pregnancy, category C, and then drug interactions as well. So other immunosuppressants and um, live vaccines. So some considerations to, to take um, is what if a patient gets admitted um, into the hospital for XYZ um, reason? Um, generally with this with the DMTs, we can consider holding them while patients are in uh, patients are admitted. The big reason, um, other reasons to consider is if we if we want to continue the medication, uh, ensuring that the patient does have patient supply available, or if we're planning on holding the medication, then noting at least when the last dose was taken, so we can see, you know, when is a good time? Do we need to reload the patients depending on which DMT they're on? Um, Another thing, too, to consider or keep in mind is most often non-infusion DMTs are specialty medications, so they're not readily available um, in the satellite pharmacies that may be dispensing um, to the floors. So um, patient supply is important to have on board if the plan is to continue, but generally you can hold uh, DMTs while patients are admitted. Uh, the other th consideration is infections and vaccines. So um, for most patients, if they do have an active infection, then we want to hold the, the medication so the patients can overcome the current infection um, and or continue their treatment and finish their treatment for XYZ infection and then plan to resume, uh, let's say, case symptom, for example. And then uh, the big key takeaway here is live vaccines are, are contraindicated with DMTs. So we want to be sure patients do receive their vaccines prior to starting therapy. Um, the big question, though, that you may ask is what about those routine flu vaccines or COVID boosters, et cetera, that patients um, 
may receive out in the community. Those vaccines are okay to administer while patients are on disease-modifying therapies. We just want to be sure um, the timeline of things. So let's say, for example, with K-Symta, um, and that's the B cell depleter auto injector med that we talked about. That medication we want to space out at least two weeks. So the dosing for that is every four weeks. So let's say a patient administers the case symptom on day one. Um, the patient can get the vaccine, shingles, or flu, for example, on day 15, and then they can resume case symptom thereafter on day 29. So that would be an example um, timeline course. The other consideration to think about is pregnancy and lactation. So um, we talked about it a lot through all of the slides earlier, but this provides just a nice summary. Um, and it also includes some information about lactation as well. Um, so, so for the breastfeeding moms and the washout period, um, if that is the if we are, you know, family planning ahead of time and talking about which DMTs to start. Um, so one of my, or one of the previous residents, a pharmacy residents that we had on board had um, looked through the literature and compiled this beautiful table um, to kind of help summarize all of the medications and um, letting you know which ones are recommended or are appropriate um, versus which ones definitely you want to stop or not even consider starting if, if they're of childbearing age. Lastly, um, with malignancy, so if patient, if the DMT is causing the malignancy, then of course we want to discontinue that therapy. Um, another thing too is we want to treat the malignancy um, and then kind of have a conversation with the oncologist and et cetera um, to kind of further discuss, do we need to restart DMT, which DMT to restart, um, depending on what type of malignancy the patient has um, and such. So that um, is a summary. I do have some cases, but I know we're running um, out of time. Um, and I wanted to provide some time for questions here. Um, so I'll kind of open up the floor. And then if we do have a little bit of time, I can pull up a case or two and we can kind of have an interaction moment. Um, but I also want to um, leave the floor open here. So overall, I guess to summarize things too is um, this is just a summary of all of the DMT options. Obviously, there's too many options to choose, but hopefully this provides you a good reference point. And, um, and if you do have further questions, definitely utilize your pharmacist so that way they, they can best help you in uh, navigating, you know, all the things about all these DMTs and the new ones that are coming out. Hello. Yeah, well, I wanna thank you very much. It was a very comprehensive review. My name is Selden Spencer, um, and I don't know whether you wanna wade into this or not, but um, I've been persuaded that, first of all, there is a condition called chronic progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, you get away from the idea of relapsing remitting and you have patients that are slowly getting worse with their walking and et cetera. Um, and I've been persuaded by two manufacturers, uh, the uh, Ocrevus and the uh, Singacine uh, Mazen type uh, products that they claim they have benefit in chronic progressive multiple sclerosis. Do you have a wish to weigh in on that claim? I'm not talking about primary progressive MS. Gotcha. Um, I would say from personal experience, I have not come across that yet. As far as how my recommendations is helping, helping guide treatment, um, I would probably lean more towards the highly effective treatment options such as the sphinx, like S1Ps or the B-cell depleters um, for treatment. So um, just providing an unbiased opinion, that's where I would lean towards. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Quiet. I know. <laughs> it does have I questions saying, can, that they I do not have access to a my, microphone. Uh, you could type them in the chat. My contact information, if you guys would like that. 
There's also the issue of transitioning. If you do have a patient that's getting worse and you say, hey, we got to try something new. Yeah. Trying to make the transition from one drug to another is miserable and problematic. I, I can state that firsthand. Yeah. So I guess, can you give me an example of like when you're transitioning from like what drug to specifically what drug, like what has been giving you troubles? I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess in that case, how I would approach it is definitely starting the conversations with the pharmacy and insurance early because that's oftentimes the biggest battle. Um, that was the problem. We couldn't get the drug. Yeah. The drug. And so... Yes, things went bad. Yeah, I would say another option that we look into is uh, the manufacturers sometimes have good programs to often offer patient assistance. Um, so sometimes they do require, you know, a couple of denials, the prior author or the appeal denial before they would consider getting the patient enrolled into like free drug programs, um, given that the patient meets the income requirements. Um, so that's some hurdles that we have to jump through. So sometimes from personal experience, it can take months and we'll just have to keep, you know, keep chugging along and make sure that at least the next step has gotten the paperwork so they can work on it. Um, but hopefully we can use the washout period to our advantage, um, given that the patient is stable. And, uh, do you, um, are there any immune markers you mentioned earlier about cytokines and then also the B cell? Are, are there any particular immune markers that uh, they're using over at the University of Iowa to guide their uh, choice and uh, use of these different uh, immune modulatory drugs? So, um, I would say from personal experience, um, we typically check definitely the CBC with diff, the aminoglobulins. Sometimes the providers consider checking the, you know, the B cell counts, but oftentimes once those are suppressed and depleted, checking afterwards is just, there's not much more you do with the value, if that makes sense is yeah. what I've heard. So sometimes they don't even bother checking. Now, otherwise, if a patient is curious and they've discontinued off therapy, then they can they will consider checking a level just to see how much is rebound. Um, otherwise, as far as immune markers go, it's not routinely um, it's not routinely checked here at the university. And, and again, this is uh, maybe not in your purview, and I don't want to be hog in time, but uh, <laughs> it certainly comes up. Somebody has been incredibly stable, mm -hmm. haven't had any problems, MRI is fine. Uh, they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s. They want to stop the drug. Yeah. So um, how well, I've noticed. There haven't been any studies to help you there. Poor no. boy out in Colorado. I was going to say. this forever, but. There was, it was at the DISCO trial um, that was hoping to give us some evidence to support discontinuation of therapy, didn't really give us any. I would say general trends from what I've seen is once patients' disease has been stable for you know five plus years and they are in their 70s and 80s, then our providers at least have been okay to just discontinue the drug because it's kind of a risk versus benefit at that point. Thank you. Of course. I got to go. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any questions online. I was going to say, I can't see the chat, but. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. It was a good talk. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.